Welcome to the Well Off Podcast. I'm your host, George Almastri, and as always, the goal is to motivate, inspire, and share success principles. On this episode, I was lucky enough to sit down with Quentin D'Souza, who's really well known in the investment community. He's an Ontario certified teacher and holds two university degrees, including a master's in education. Pretty impressive if you ask me. He's a specialist in buy, fix, refinance, and if you want to learn more about that strategy, he's got a book called The Ultimate Wealth Strategy. I just recently read it. Great book, highly recommended. And he's also well known for doing quite a few joint venture partnerships. He runs the Durham REI meeting, which is east of Toronto. If you are interested in learning more about how to invest and you want to surround yourself with like-minded people, it's a great club to attend. So highly recommend it as well. You're going to find out how he gave up a six-figure teacher salary to dedicate himself more towards his real estate investments. There's quite a bit to learn, and I hope you'll enjoy. I'm here with Quentin Souza. I just met Quentin for the first time. He's got Durham REI, which is an educational program for investors. And I just recently found out that he was a teacher for 18 years and he's got a master's of education. From my understanding and my research, you went to U of T to get your bachelor's degree, your undergrad. Wow. Yes. Yeah. You went to York for your master's. Yeah. And I guess you don't need to do these programs anymore, but you have an interest in helping people and motivating others to get into investing. Is that correct? Yeah, I left my teaching profession in 2014, but I still love to educate. And I think um, it's just in line with my, my own values. So it, it makes me feel good. Yeah. I, uh, I do it I, because I enjoy it for sure. Yeah. Aside from that, you're a father. You've yeah. got two boys. Yeah. One of them, I think, is 11 years old. Wow, you are good. <laughs> 11 and uh, 14. 11 so, uh, well, they're turning 11 and 14 at yeah. high school next year for my oldest uh, boy. So that's kind of kind of new, going to be a, a new experience to kind of dive into with him. So he's going to get his G1 or G2 right. and then it's all over for that from there. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. And aside from that, you've got three books. Yeah. If you want to tell us a little bit about them. Sure. This is the Ultimate Wealth Strategy book. It's about the buy, fix, refinance, and rent strategy. I, I wrote it with some good friends, Jeff Woods and Andrew Brennan. If you're interested in the strategy that I've used for the last 10 years, it's a great illustration of it. The Filling Vacancy Toolbox, which goes through the process of how to fill a vacancy in Ontario, what to do, due diligence. It really is a, a book that answers a lot of people's questions on how to do it. And then uh, the property management toolbox, which is kind of like the day-to-day -day of how to uh, manage a, a property, whether it's, you know, one property or 50 uh, units, you know, it, it goes through that process. So uh, the books are, are a way for me to help educate people so that they can go and take action because that's what I want to see them do, right? And one of our mantras here is uh, being an action taker not just educating yourself, but going out and, and doing something with right. that, right? It, it allowed me to answer a lot of questions in a um, short amount of time so somebody can go back and they can refer to it. It, it really is, um, I've gotten a lot of great compliments on those books, so very practical. Yeah, for sure. I just read The Ultimate Wealth Strategy, cool, cool. and uh, I just like the way it was written. It's different from typical investment books because you're kind of telling the story of a couple and how most people probably feel when they're going through the process of investing for the first time. So I, I really enjoyed that. Yeah, you, you know, like Jack, the mentor in yeah. the book is um, Jeff, Andrew, and Quentin, yeah. first letters, right? Yeah. So we... that was clever, <laughs> smart. <laughs> uh, just to go back with regards to your kids, yeah. to start there, do you have any hopes for them to get into investing? And also, did you begin investing in order to maybe give them a better future and, and pass on some of these properties? Well, I think the way that I started into real estate is I explored a lot of other ventures first. So stocks, different types of businesses. And I just found that real estate was an easy uh, solution for me to do real estate investing while I was a professional. So it gave me the opportunity to kind of slowly move my way into it. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I, I always hope to pass on, you know, what I can for my kids, but but it's more than just the idea of giving them something. It's now that I have the ability to teach them something and um, in something that is more than just, you know, giving them a million dollars. It's more like giving them the ability to make millions of dollars. And, you know, how, being able to teach them that is something that I, I would never have been able to do if I didn't go on this journey myself. You know, 
I was, I, I took my youngest son to uh, the cottage and on the way up, my, my oldest son had a baseball tournament and my wife was down with, with him. And so, you know, I, I put on like Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the audio book, and, you know, we listened to it and talked about it on the way there and the way back. And, you know, to me, like those sort of opportunities are, are great. You know, not everybody's going to do that and take that time to do it. But I think, um, you know, talking about it with you know, our, our young people is the only way for them to learn about it. And I think we, we don't do that enough in our society. We kind of hide the talk about money. I mean, my parents never talked about money. I don't know about yours from growing up. And so it was always this strange kind of thing, talking about uh, putting money aside, you know, being able to invest it, what are assets, what are liabilities, you know, how do, how do people grow their money? What do people invest in? What is an investment, right? Those things, we, we really do need to talk about that with our, our, uh, our kids. So, um, I mean, uh, for me, I think the big thing that I'm going to pass on is something that that can never be taken away from them is the ability to make as much as they want, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's a powerful tool. And if more people just educated themselves in doing it, they could change, you know, a lot of their lives mm -hmm. for sure. For sure. And when did you start talking to your kids about investing and about money? You know, when I started to do it, I started to talk about it. I talked about it with my wife, who's tired of me talking about it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I talk about it with my kids. So, I mean, it's a journey. I'm just open about what I'm doing and, you know, sharing some of my trials and tribulations. Like, you know, if it's not all roses and, and unicorns, right? There are days when you have to get involved and you have tough times with tenants and, and they hear about that. And then they hear about, you know, oh, well, we're able to, you know, go to Turks and Caicos. Actually, uh, uh, Paul, um, you know, we're renting his his uh, his place in the Turks oh, and yeah? Caicos, right? Oh, cool. And, um, you know, like things like that, we can go as a family and, and have a great time. But it's the results, the fruits of the labor of, you know, all those times with the tenants and struggling with finance and getting, putting it all together and then having the machine continue to work itself, right? Mm -hmm. So... Um, uh, you know, all of that kind of comes into play and comes together. So, yeah. yeah. And while doing a bit of research, I found out that at one point you had a six figure income. Yes. So I'm assuming that was through teaching. Yeah. And then you decided to give that up to get more involved in real estate investing. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah. So in Ontario, public workers who earn over a hundred thousand are on the sunshine list. Even as a teacher, I was always trying to do more and more. I would work on summer projects. I would you know, I was on the path, um, I took my principal qualifications in order to go down that road. So I was doing a lot of extra, I, I did summer school, um, not principal work, but coordinator type of work in order to boost my income up. So I was doing quite well. I, you know, I was definitely over six figures and I continued to do that. But for me, what I, the future I saw was being, a, unfortunately, principals in our day and age are middle managers more than anything else. At least that's why I see them. They can affect change in the school, which is still a powerful thing. And, the, and they do have the effect on the lives of, of the kids. So I think that's a great thing. But I found that a lot of what happens in, in school, the school system is top down. And um, I didn't want to be at the bottom of a top down you know, relationship. I want to be the top and I want to be able to affect change in my life, my family's life and other people's lives. So running a business and being an entrepreneur is really, you know, what, what I thought I could, uh, I could do. And, you know, giving up the security of the golden handcuffs of uh, the pension of that income and, you know, just taking control and, and being able to do that for myself and for my family. I think I really have to thank my wife for, you know, believing in me and being able to go down that path because that's a big, big change, right? The way that I see our finances and what we've done since that time, there's no comparison. Mm -hmm. It was the best move I ever made. I mean, I've joined different groups that have helped me along the way too. So I'm a part of the entrepreneurs organization and they have a very high threshold in order to be part of that, those groups. And, you know, I'm just privileged to have such a, a great group of people that I'm with in, we call them forum groups. And it's kind of like a mastermind situation, but it's a little different. And being in, accepted into groups like Tiger 21, right? Like I'm, I'm not there yet because I'm not at the point where I, I'm just in a defensive position. But I know that those type of groups help you to get to where you want to go. 
And that's why places like Rockstar and Durham REI are, are great places to go because it's a stepping stone to help you, to push you into the right direction. Having people doing what you're doing and seeing them do helps you to do, right? It pushes you out of your comfort zone because that's where, you know, all the magic happens, right? If you, if you want to do anything that's worth it, you have to push yourself out of your comfort zone, right? You can do some pretty amazing things. I, I never like to go up on my roof and put up Christmas lights. I used to call my sister-in-law over. Now this is going to be, right? <laughs> she's a firefighter. She's awesome. Yeah. So is my brother-in-law. They're firefighters, right? But I call them over to put up Christmas lights. You know, not really like going up on heights. I was in the Philippines uh, last month, and I jumped off a 35-foot cliff, right? And if that's not facing, you know, your fears, I don't know what is. Like, that was a physical fear that I had. Yeah. And it took some time to get to that point. Yeah. Lots of small jumps, mm -hmm. you know. And everybody has those small things that they can do that helps to push them to that big jump, whatever it is, in their life. So, I mean, I'm happy I did that for myself. Yeah, but anybody can do it too, right? They just have to take those small jumps first. Yeah. Right? Sure. And they can get there. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned something before we got started that... If you were interested in doing a 10 kilometer running event, for example, and you get there and you see that there's children, there's seniors, there's all sorts of people doing it, it'll encourage you and give you confidence that you can do it as well, which is the same as being a part of a group of investors like Durham REI or the Rockstar events. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, what you want to do is you want to put yourself in those type of positions or you do something that's uncomfortable mm -hmm. and you push yourself to that point. So uncomfortable would be like if you're, if you want to work out like every week, right? And that's one of your goals for, the, well, I do quarterly goals, but you know, let's say it's whatever goals you have, you want to do that. So you sign up for like a, one of those like boot camps, the, like the 90 day boot camps, and you go and you just overcommit. And that's one way to do it too, right? Yeah. To get into that, that sort of mindset. Uh, and, and then that way you're there, you know, you've committed to doing it, right? So there, there's lots of ways to kind of push yourself. For sure, yeah, for sure. So when you when you gave up your teaching job, that mm -hmm. security of that, uh, did you have a couple properties at that point, or were you just jumping in brand new, nothing in your portfolio? Oh no way! I, I had an, I had it been uh, I had invested for fifteen years, but for ten years really has been where I've kind of focused on real estate, and I probably could have left maybe a year or two years earlier than I did. But I'm, I was very conservative about, you know, what I was doing and I was very uh, purposeful about it. So when I, I left, I would say that my cash flow was about $5,000 a month. That was from, I had a portfolio of properties, uh, probably around 18 to 20, so I, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. to be honest. You're, like, I mean, it was a, a little while ago, but I mean, I've definitely grown a lot since then. And I continue to do, you know, four to five properties a year. I, I spent two years in there from 2014 to 16. I was doing a lot of flips. I did a, a dozen flips, right? And I mean, if I if I look back at all those properties that I flipped, if I would have held them, I probably would have made another million on them. So, I mean, but in retrospect, that's the, that what could have happened. But by getting the funds from all of those flips, I was able to use that to leverage into other projects. So I took those funds and I was able to purchase some buildings, some other duplexes, you know, I was able to do a lot with, with those funds. And I still continue to do that. Right. right. And I know you're, you're big on the buy, fix, refinance, rent strategy. Yeah in combination with building up your cash flow. Yeah. I've heard from different people, because I'm not where you're at uh, at this point, but yeah. I've heard from a lot of people that the cash flow that you earn from these properties, you often can't really account for it as income because you have to reinvest it, repair the property and, and the upkeep and all that. What's your take on that? Well, you should always have a maintenance and repair budget in your, you know, the way that you build your portfolio is you have your hard costs, right? So you have your... And this is after the refi. You have to keep this in mind that it's not before the refi, it's after the refi. So mortgage, insurance, taxes, um, those are all the hard costs that you want to include into your, your numbers. And then afterwards, you want to include your vacancy repairs and, and maintenance into, the, into your numbers as well. And so you can include those numbers into your cash flow and make sure that the property still cash flows after that. I mean, any, it depends on the age of the building. The beautiful thing about the strategy is that you're actually doing the renovations to bring up the quality of the product, right? 
And so you are effectively eliminating some of those repairs and maintenance costs. Yeah. So it's actually lower after you've done this strategy. Mm -hmm. But you always have to consider that. And I always buy for cash flow. I don't care what anybody tells you. I mean, for me, I buy for cash flow because if I don't care whether the market goes down 25 or 30 percent, it's not going to affect me at all. Mm -hmm. I can hold those properties for 30 years and they'll be fine. As long as I've done, you know, stress testing of my portfolio, I look at interest rates, look at the 10 year rate, plug that into what my my current mortgage rate is. And I'm able to decide, OK, this property can support itself over the long term. And if I ever get worried, I can throw it into a 10 year and, you know, I still have that property and my cash flow is locked in for that time. And plus, I get my rent increases, right, over the, that period of time. Or if they turn over between tenants, I'll be able to raise it even more, right? Right. And uh, with these properties that you own, are you keeping a reserve? So are you, yeah. say, putting two or three months of expenses in a separate bank account just, just in case things go south? Yeah. So as you grow your portfolio, what you'll find is that you can, you can do different things. When you have one or two or three properties, yeah, for sure. You take three months. I usually do three months of hard costs into an account. But as you grow, as you get like 20 or 30 or 50 properties, like the scale becomes a little different. You can put that money together into a different account and, you know, you can kind of scale it differently as long as you have the funds there, right? Because in order to earn money, it can't be sitting in a bank account. You have to be able to, like, you take those those dollars and you send them out and you get them to go get you some more dollars and come back. And you want to make sure that, you know, you're balancing yourself. You want to have the cash, but you also want to be able to take, if you have 20 properties and you have $3,000 a month, let's say, that's $60,000 a month sitting in a bank account for really, you know, 3% to 5% of where you're actually going to need those funds. So it's better to be able to take those funds and use them for for what you need to and then group it a little differently. But definitely when you're starting out, three months makes a lot of sense for sure. Yeah. And so for maybe some of the people who don't really understand what we're talking about when we say buy, fix, refinance, yeah. do you think you can just very quickly explain it? Yeah, yeah. So I'll give you an example with the deal that I just did. So I, I bought a property in November for 300000 it's a detached two-story house in Oshawa. It had a basement, one bedroom basement apartment in it, and it was really poor, poor condition. Like like 20 cats were living in it, it smelled really bad. There were there was leaks in the roof, leaks everywhere, the basement. Um, there was leaking from the kitchen and the main floor into the basement. Lots of lots of work. So the fixed part of it is you're investing money into the project. And what you want to do is make sure that your purchase price and your fixed price is a lot lower than what you, the after repair value is. So in this case, I bought it for 300. I put 110 into it. I did new kitchens, new bathrooms, legalized that basement apartment, made sure that I had the declaration pre-91 that it existed from the owner, made sure to go through the legalization process, did everything from you know the floors to the roof, everything in between, siding, new driveway, and the property refinanced at 610000 So if you think of it, I have three hundred and I have 110. Now, because I'm, I have a large portfolio of properties, I'm getting commercial mortgages, so I'm putting 25% down instead of 20. So I've got a 75% loan to value. So on 610, my mortgage is 457, somewhere around there, right? I have 410 into it. That means that I got paid about $50,000 to own the house. Right. And I have a, about a $300 a month cash flow on that property. Mm -hmm. Now, and the, everything is renovated to the, you know, right. right up to, that's practically a, you know, a new house the way that you, you, you see it, right? Now, I didn't change any of the structure or anything like that, but I did enough so that that uh, property is going to be good for the next few years anyways. Mm -hmm. And I have an infinite return. Like, how do you calculate return when you have no money, right? And you get cash flow every month, yeah. right? Now, that's a home run. You could go into Oshawa, pick up a property for four fifty, maybe put 70000 into the basement apartment, refi at 550 570 mm -hmm. right? And then you're still lowering your initial investment and you're getting a higher ROI. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what you want to do, right? You, you make money when you buy your property, right? And you buy it right. You invest money into the fixing of it, 
and then you refinance it, and the difference is how you, you push the value up. Yeah. And adding a, a secondary suite is a really easy way to push up the value mm -hmm. quickly, right? Um, other ways are if the house is distressed in some way, like this house in particular had that cat pee smell. It was yeah. on the market for 19 days. Like the, Anybody could have bought it. Not just me, anybody could have bought it. But, you know, there was something about it that nobody wanted. I knew how to solve the problems. Yeah. And then that's how I was able to take advantage of the, the value, right? Right. And is that is that type of deal something that's typical mm -hmm. for you now to get into, or are you more focused on say smaller single family homes where you may not get uh, the refinance value to cover all of the initial investment? So that would be like a home run, yeah. right? So usually it's you know I, I can refi maybe five to ten percent out of my total down payment. Yeah. So. Uh, the return is still, you know, you're talking about an over a 50% return anyways. And I'll typically work with joint venture partners and, and that's what I'll be doing with them, right? So I'll take a joint venture partner, they'll put the down payment down, they'll qualify for the mortgage and then they'll get great returns for the next umpteen years, right? Mm -hmm. I did three duplex conversions over the last year and usually we get back at least 5% off of the total, all our renovation money, plus a little bit more, yeah. right? And so, and plus you get cash flow on that. Right. I've also done um, small buildings. So I have a six unit where uh, I'm working with a property manager. She's, she's awesome. She's turned over four of the six units, raised the cash flow of $2,000 a month, which in a, a building actually, because we're dealing with cap rates, right? It increased the value of the building by four hundred thousand dollars, and that enables me to pull out more money. Yeah. Right. And so that's the uh, so I will pull out almost all of my initial investment in that six unit building. Yeah. After a year. After a year. That's yeah. Good. So do that in the stock market. Yeah. Like you know, real estate is just you know people don't understand the the after the ROI that you can get. You know, after tax ROI is huge. Right. Right. And people always you know look at they don't even consider taxes, mm -hmm. but it's it's an important thing to consider. You have a good, you know, you should have good quality accountants and lawyers on your team, you know, advising you uh, properly. Mm -hmm. And then you have to understand it yourself. So, for example, if you looked at inflation and and you looked at from two thousand and eight to two thousand and eighteen, inflation has gone up. I think it's about eighteen um, percent. And then if you look at wages. So wages used to be about $20 an hour average. Now it's about $25 an average. So that's about 25%. There's been some increase in, in wages, so 7% real. But then let's look at real estate. So real estate in 2008 was like a duplex, or sorry, a single family home, detached home in Oshawa was about 200 and 218,000, let's say 220. The average detached house in Oshawa goes for 550 now, 10 years later. That's a 140% increase. Yeah. How can somebody who gets 7% more, you want to have those hard assets in your portfolio because that's where wealth is being created. If you're not investing outside of your job, you're going to lose. Savers don't make money. But that same person who put $100,000 in, in their bank account probably ended up over the last 10 years with you know, maybe $102,000, yeah. $103,000, like nothing. So th those lost money because inflation is 18%. Mm -hmm. So the value of their $100,000 is more like $82,000. Mm -hmm. And they may have made two and they've lost 18. What do you think? Yeah. I don't want to put it in a bank. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Obviously, you believe in investing in real estate. Yeah. What what percent would you say of your portfolio consists of real estate investments? And do you have other investments? Like, do you invest in stocks and maybe bonds or other forms of investments? Yeah, so that's a good question, actually. I think that uh, if you asked a financial planner, the, they'd give you this BS answer about having a balanced portfolio and, you know, risk assessments. Yeah. And I think a financial planner's job is to, I'm probably going to make a whole bunch of people mad here. <laughs> a financial planner's job is to not lose you money. That's what their job is. If you think about it, their job is not to lose you money, and it, but it's not to grow your wealth. If you want to grow your wealth, you need to do something different. You can't have this balanced portfolio stuff. You have to 
put your eggs in, in a basket and watch the basket, like Warren Buffett says. His thing is stocks. I think if you want to grow something, like do really well at it, you have to commit a majority of your assets to that, that thing. If at some point you want to start defending that wealth, then you could invest in other things. So, I mean, if you're going to invest in real estate, invest in real estate. Put 80 to 100% in there. And then as you've got to a point where you can take some of the funds out and put it in other things. So, yes, I have hard assets like gold and silver. I have a ownership in a, in a company. And not a company that I run, but I have bought private equity into companies. I've done different types of investing, you know, puts and calls investing, different things. But I would still say that I would have a majority, still 80% of my wealth comes from real estate. Yeah. Just think about, we had this great presentation a while back on risk. And if you think about what your bank is willing to give you money-wise and what they think of risk. So let's say you went to go start your own business and it cost $100,000. How much money do you think a bank is going to give you? First time business owner, how much do you think they're going to give you? Like, if it's 100000 that you're looking to borrow, yeah. how much will the bank give you? I don't uh, know, like 15000 Yeah, maybe 15000 20, <laughs> yeah. like like maybe one-fifth, yeah. right? Now, let's say you have a stock portfolio and you want to borrow against your stock portfolio. How much do you, like if you had $100,000 in stocks, how much loan do you think they would give you? I think you could get like 50, 50%, let's say 50,000. Okay. Yeah. Now you go and want to buy a house. Mm -hmm. You're going to put what? 20% down 20%. to own a hundred percent of a house, yeah. the bank is going to give you 80%. What does that tell you about the risk that they see the house versus right. the business versus even the stock portfolio? Yeah, for sure. Even if you looked at it that way from a risk assessment perspective, there is a lot of benefits to investing in real estate. I think that um, you need to have real estate in your portfolio, whether it becomes a small part or a bigger part, it depends on how far you want to grow. But you should always have a cash flow in real estate. It shouldn't be an equity speculation play. Right. You need to make sure that the property is able to carry itself. And that requires you to do some work. Like you're going to have to dig to, to be able to do that. The idea is not to buy a condo and put 50% down. Yeah. Right. You want to be able to leverage your money in order to make the most of it. So being able to find those assets that when you put 20% down or 25% down, you're able to get a good monthly return from it. Mm -hmm. Right. And that means that you have to work a little bit, find those areas, talk to people. Sometimes it blows my mind that people want to buy a $500,000 asset but can't buy a $40 book to learn about it yeah. or spend a couple hundred dollars on education. Just a little bit could save you a lot if you just learn about it before you go out and buy that $500,000 condo. Spend the time, understand it, like we're talking about now, even spending the time to listen and learn about how to decide what is a cash flow positive property. Some people will include mortgage pay down and call it positive or put 50% down and call it positive. Yeah. To me, it's not the way that I would look at it. I'm trying to maximize my return and I'm also trying to look at how I can best have my dollars that are going out there get more dollars and bring them back. Now for those that live say like in Toronto mm -hmm. or Mississauga, Oakville, and they're not able to find cash flowing properties with 20% down, do you suggest that they go out of the city, out of their area and look for properties out somewhere like in Hamilton or somewhere out here, for example? You know what, I think there's, um, I think what you need to do is find places. First, you need to talk to other investors in the area and find out what they're doing. Sometimes it's not about just picking a property off the MLS. Sometimes it means that you have to be a little creative. So let's say you're working in downtown Toronto and what it means for you in downtown Toronto to be able to cash flow is to take a single family home, invest in topping it up, putting three, four hundred thousand dollars into it, and then making it into a triplex. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're, you're looking at the highest and best use of a particular piece of land. And by doing that, now you've cash flowed in the, in Mississauga or Toronto. Yeah. The problem is you just can't just go and pick it off the MLS and it's right. cash flow. If you go into like St. Catharines or you go into Oshawa or Clarington or further east, it, it's easier to just pick it off the MLS and to be able to be cash flow positive. But it's becoming harder and harder to do that. Yeah. So you need to know what works in your area and invest the time to learn it. 
And then by doing that, you're going to be able to, to do well with real estate. But if you just buy something and hold on to it and pray, that's not the way to do it, right? So it depends. <laughs> you can make it work in different areas, but you have to understand strategies. There are a lot of strategies out there. Buy, fix, refinance, and rent is just one of them. Yeah. And the more that you can add to your toolbox, the more that you can learn. And working with experienced realtors, mortgage brokers, hiring a coach. I have a business coach that I work with. He's great. He's in Vancouver and I talk to him once a month and he's been awesome in helping me. But from like a, a time management, achievement, kind of getting over fear and awesome guy. Hiring those people and having them on your team can help you to make that right decision. And looking for the realtor that has a property, that mortgage broker that understands rental property. And that is able to, especially on the finance side, look at it from a portfolio perspective, not just like an individual, not just the next deal, but works with you. And let's say your goal is to buy five properties. Okay, this is how we're going to buy the five properties, right? It's a different perspective. Yeah. And there's, there's great people out there that can help you to do that, for sure. There's basically two main categories of investing. There is the equity investing and then cash flow investing. I've heard that... You can't really go into an investment expecting to succeed in both. You have to pick one and and stick with it and focus on that strategy. Would you agree with that? No, that's both. Really, like I've been getting both equity and cash flow for a decade. Again, it's knowing that what investment works in what area. Yeah. Right. If you did that, that single family home up to a, a triplex in Toronto, it might work. There are great people out there that are investing in Aurelia and they're adding a suite to the bottom. They're, they're doing really well and they're getting appreciation, which is your equity, and they're getting cash flow. There are people in, in Oshawa, there are people in Hamilton. You can get both. And I think that you need to kind of, especially in Ontario, you, you can do that. You just have to be more careful about how you're investing. I think that's black and white. It's making it easier than, like it's just kind of simplifying it, which is fine. But I think you can get both. And if you, if you aren't getting both, then you're not working hard enough. Mm -hmm. You've taken the easy path. You've bought like a, a mutual fund, which sucks anyways, because you've got to pay all these fees. Yeah. And, you know, the, the taxes. Taking back and all and that you tax. mentioned. Yeah. yeah. Here's the next one. If yep. you could go back 15 years, what advice would you give yourself? You, you know, that's funny. There's a real estate investor in, in our group here who's like, he's 22. And he's got, I think he's about 22. I don't know. It's around there. He's got four properties, four or five. And then we ask him, like, what would you have done four years ago? And he said, I would have bought more property, yeah. right? Like, it's the same thing as what you would have done 10, 15 yeah. years ago. I think that dwelling on the past is kind of, it's a hard, hard game because everything that, that you could have done before is different than what you can do now. But what I probably would have done is invested more time in taking some time and looking around at what other investors are doing and going harder, faster. I think that would have been definitely more well beneficial for me. I'm quite happy with where I am now. I've got no no complaints. But um, of course, you know, I'd love to have bought more property 15 years ago. Spending some time in, in educating myself and perhaps hiring a coach sooner would probably have helped to propel my journey a little bit faster. The more time that you can spend educating yourself and taking action at the same time, the faster you'll propel yourself forward. That's so definitely something that I wish I probably did more of 15 years ago. That's great. And who's yeah. your coach, by the way? You mentioned him twice. My coach is out in the West Coast. He's got his own coaching program. I prefer not to have no problem. Every, all the real estate investors in the world going to him. <laughs> right, right. But uh, he's, yeah. he's a great guy. And I, like, I don't mind referring him to a couple people. Yeah, but sure. There's a, a lot of people that have been mentors and coaches to me, too. Like, uh, I would say that even Tom and Nick, you know, in their way, have been mentors and, uh, to me. I've had developers that are mentors to me. I've had house flippers that are, are friends and, and mentors to me. And uh, the people at Durham REI I, I can be mentors, right? There are different people in there who, are, who do different things that can help you. And I think it's important that you have those people in your life and you, you talk to them and they, and they help to push you forward. I have a great joint venture partner that keeps pushing me forward to do buildings and I'd love to do that with them, right? There's all these people that can be mentors and coaches in your life and it's just finding the ones that, that kind of work for you. 
that's great. I'm sure you had to seek out your mentors. You yeah. did, they didn't just come to you. You always have to make an effort to find them, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. absolutely. And sometimes it could even be a, like books can be mentors, right? right? Like um, there, there's lots of different ways that you can pull information that helps to propel you forward. Mm -hmm. What you want to do is you want to take the information, internalize it, but then take action right. on it, right? There's no use in learning something if you don't use it. It's a waste of brain space. Yeah. And if you're not going to use it, then forget about it and then move on to something that you're actually going to take action on. Mm -hmm. But without being a little bit uncomfortable in the stomach and doing something a little different, you're not really growing. Right. right. So that's why I like to, to continue to kind of push and do that. Mm -hmm. That's great. The final segment here is the random five. I ask you random questions oh, okay. <laughs> and you just answer just like quick fire questions. So yeah. the first one would be, who's your favorite athlete? Ooh, my favorite athlete. I don't know. Not much of a sports fan? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I like baseball. Yeah. I, um, I like hockey. Marner. Mitch Marner. Okay. Yeah, I like yeah. Actually, you know why I like Mitch Marner? He came out to my son's baseball team, cool. and he's just a good guy. He brought the Memorial Cup out to the kids' team, and they took pictures with him. That's awesome. Mitch Marner is just a... He's an athlete who is just a great person. Mm -hmm. And I think that that speaks volumes for who he is and what he does for, for Toronto, for sure. Yeah. yeah, the world needs more of that. Yeah. What's your best childhood memory? My best childhood memory, I had my own lawn care business. And I was you know, going to, dropping off flyers to people's houses oh, and, yeah. and then mowing lawns and there'd be all this stuff going on in the house. It was always exciting and interesting and kind of doing that side business when I was you know, 13 was, was oh. pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. So I, I liked doing that. And I had a little, I'd have a job. I worked at, at a hotel and then on the other days that I wasn't working, I would do this uh, business. So it was, it was pretty cool. That's almost your son's age now. Do you think he'll, he'll get into stuff like that soon? Well, you know, my oldest son is actually umpiring baseball. So oh, he, cool. he gets paid like 30 bucks a game and he does three or four games a week. So Great. for him, it's, yeah. Good. He's, he's good got money. some, yeah, he's got some, some stuff on the go and he's using something he really loves, which is baseball to do it, which is, I encourage anybody to do, right? If, you, yeah. if you're doing what you love, it's not really a, a job anyways. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Next question would be, what's the most influential book for you? Well, I've got a lot of really influential book, books that I've, I've read over, over the years. I mean, Rich Dad, Poor Dad is kind of like a classic. The one that I've read most recently that I, I liked was uh, Wealth Can't Wait. And I can't remember the name of the author off the top of my head, but it was great because one of the things that we all need to do more often is do a net worth analysis. Take a look at our net worth every year, at least twice a year, you should be doing a net worth analysis so you can know, is your wealth growing or is it shrinking? It really goes into that, into that book. And there's a lot of different points to it, but I just read that last month. So that's my new favorite book. Okay, your new favorite book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and finally, what's the one thing that you can eat every day? That I can eat every day? Well, I can eat salad every day. Yeah. Like a, a good chicken Caesar salad. Not even Caesar, just a chicken salad. I'm, I'm really liking those uh, a lot now. Oh, so cool. I can do that every day for sure. It's a healthy choice. Most people would probably say pizza or something. Yeah, <laughs> it, it would, if you would have asked me a few months ago, it would have been pizza. But, yeah. um, you know, I'm really focused. I've, I've lost 50 pounds over the oh. last four months. So, I mean, it's been uh, working towards that. I've got all my other goals, you know, I have quarterly goals. And my first quarter was 25 pounds. My next quarter is 25 and so on until I get to my, my goal. So I've kind of refocused a little bit. And it's not all about money, right? It's all about quality of life. Mm -hmm. And so that is part of my quality of life. And so is education, is quality of life for me. There's been a ton of good stuff in here. I really awesome. appreciate the time. Before we end things, was there anything you wanted to discuss in terms of services you might offer or ways that people can contact you? You can check out durhamrei.ca if you're interested in learning more about the club. And I've got coaching and stuff on there. But I think the big message is that if you want to improve your current situation, you need to do something different. And if all you're doing is the same thing, you're going to get the same results. If you want to be or do something different, you have to change. And the only way to change is to get out there and take action and right. do it. Right. And that's how you'll, you'll pull yourself up and do what you want to do. 
So yeah, I've heard you say that throughout the podcast and even before we started about taking action and you're, you're right. Cause you can get all this information. If you do nothing with it, it's as though you've never, you've never learned it. So it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. So again, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. All right. Sounds good, George.